Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So uh, today we're doing the first governor of Massachusetts, John Winthrop. Of course, before I get started with John Winthrop, what did I leave out from last week from uh, the Pilgrims? And uh, so William Bradford, uh, I had talked about uh, how he was so close to Squanto that he refused to give him up, uh, even though Squanto was worthy of being executed, uh, he had betrayed his people. Um, and so uh, the messengers came. They wanted Squanto's head on a platter, and they were there to do it. Uh, William Bradford refused to give him up. He, uh, he was so uh, knit together with Squanto that uh, he was not uh, embarrassed as he was and knowing that Squanto deserved to be executed, uh, he would not give him up. Uh, the messengers went away very angry and uh, as time went on, Squanto knew that he had to stay in Plymouth uh, if he had left, uh, he would be executed on the spot by any Indian who found him. Six months later, he finally had enough uh, courage to leave uh, the grounds of Plymouth with William Bradford. They went on a trading mission, uh, and the village, wherever they went, I, I'm not sure which village they went to, uh, they went and they spent the night, and the next day, Squanto's, uh, Squanto started bleeding from his nose. He felt terribly ill, and he died within a couple of days. We're not sure what it was that killed Squanto. It has been suggested that he was poisoned by uh, the native... It had been suggested that he had been poisoned uh, because of what had happened earlier, and that is a real possibility. But as I said, uh, we don't really know for sure. Uh, but um, within six months of the time that he was supposed to be executed, he was dead, and so that issue had been settled. <coughs> So John Winthrop, uh, this is the only likeness that we have of him. Uh, we believe there may have been two portraits done, but we're not sure. There might have been a miniature uh, of him. But um, this is all we have for now. I guess people uh, are having a hard time with their clocks this morning. <laughs> the Academy Awards last night. Oh, the Academy Awards. It's the interior clock. Yeah, the interior clock. That, that's the difficult part. So the bibliography for uh, John Winthrop, this first one, uh, Samuel Elliot Morrison, a great historian, uh, written many, many works on uh, both the Puritans. Uh, he was involved in uh, uh, World War II also, and he writ, wrote uh, a number of books. Uh, but this one, The Builders of the Bay Colony, this is a, a collection of several uh, short biographies of many of the people who were involved in the uh, uh, Boston founding, um, and so John Winthrop is just one of many uh, characters that he talks about, uh, maybe 20 pages or so uh, out of this work. So if you want a really quick rundown on uh, John Winthrop, this, is, this would be a good one. Um, Edmund S. Morgan, The Puritan Dilemma, The Story of John Winthrop. If I was to uh, recommend any of these books, uh, as uh, a thorough, uh, well-researched uh, look into the life of John Winthrop, this would be it. Uh, this is actually the first book that I ever read on uh, uh, John Winthrop. 
probably geez, 40 years ago. Um, why John Winthrop interested me, I can't really tell you at the time. If I was just beginning to be interested in history uh, in my college years, and I read this when I, I thought this was a marvelous book, um, which is curious for me because normally I, I'm more interested in, uh, say, the action heroes of history. Uh, and John Winthrop is not an action hero. Uh, he didn't go out to war. He didn't kill anybody. Uh, he was governor of Massachusetts, and that's his claim to fame. But it's still a very interesting life. Uh, but this, was, this is uh, the best, most uh, uh, engaging uh, biography that I have, I think. 224 pages, so it's not, not a long read either. Derek B. Rutman, Win Winthrop's Boston, Portrait of a Puritan Town. Um, so this one, another very well done book. Um, and I would say though, since it's not technically a biography of uh, John Winthrop, uh, but it's a story of how Boston developed over the years that he was there and uh, the years that he was governor. Um, it's still very interesting, at least for me. I, I generally shy away from books like this that uh, talk about municipal government, which doesn't sound very uh, exciting at all, uh, but, but this one is actually pretty well done. Uh, 324 pages. Um, it, it gives you a very good insight into uh, how Boston and New England developed over these years. Uh, so in that sense, it's really interesting. Francis J. Bremer, uh, John Winthrop, America's Forgotten Founding Father. How many of you have even heard of John Winthrop? And how many of you did not? Yeah. So yeah. The Forgotten Founding Father. He is uh, worthy of being remembered. Uh, there's, there's a lot, and uh, we will be talking about shortly, um, the, uh, the founding of our country did not begin in 1776. It didn't begin with the Founding Fathers, with George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, the founding of our country began at this time, uh, especially with uh, John Winthrop and the founding of Boston. Um, so anyway, uh, this is a great book. This is the book that should have been written many years before. When I was in college and studying John Winthrop, I was going to make him uh, a focus of mine, uh, but there was no really extensive biography at that time, uh, back in the 1980s. So uh, when this book came out, long after uh, my, my peak interest in uh, John Winthrop uh, had passed, uh, I thought, wow, this is, this is the book that should have been, uh, that I should have had you know, 20 years earlier. Uh, very thoroughly done. Um, this is not the type of book that I would recommend for summer reading, um, even though it's, it is uh, entertaining enough it gets into a lot of things that you probably uh, don't even want to know about uh, John Winthrop. But uh, very well done anyway. This next one, John Winthrop, Oliver Cromwell and the Land of Promise. I was um, a little bit disappointed with this book. This is a book, it's probably designed for middle school kids. And when I saw this, you can kind of tell the cover looks like it was designed for middle school kids. And that's okay, because I, I love middle school books. Um, what I was disappointed in uh, was that the title is very misleading. When I saw this, I thought, wow, this is great. This is something that I, I didn't know about. I didn't know that uh, John Winthrop had a relationship with Oliver Cromwell. Yeah. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe there was a correspondence uh, between the two, and that should be really interesting. Well, there isn't. There's no relationship between John Winthrop and Oliver Cromwell other than they were both uh, after kind of the same cause, uh, but they are on different continents entirely. Um, so 
what this book does is basically give you a brief uh, account of John Winthrop's life, and then it gives you another brief account of Oliver Cromwell. Um, but the two never really interacted at all. So as far as it goes, it's not a bad book, but um, just a little uh, disappointing that it, it's, it's misleading in the title. And then finally, uh, John Winthrop himself, he wrote uh, what is now called the History of New England from 1630 to 1649. Um, uh, of course, any historian would want to have this book because uh, it's John Winthrop himself. Um, the title that has come down to us is misleading in that it's not a history, it's a journal. He had intended to write a history. Uh, he never got around to it, so we have his journal, the notes that he wrote as governor uh, of Massachusetts. Um, this is a truly impressive book, this edition that I have. <coughs> Two volumes in one. Um, it was edited by James Savage back in 1825. The reason it's so impressive is that um, the, it's annotated thoroughly throughout. And I would, uh, I would guess that probably half of this is not even John Winthrop himself, it's James Savage writing notes about what uh, John Winthrop wrote. So, but, and that's, it's a great thing because there's so much that he wrote that uh, we may not have really understood. Uh, uh, someone just reading this may not understand the references that John Winthrop uh, has made, and so uh, the notes are invaluable in this book. Question. Yes. For each of these lectures, you have given a critique, a very erudite critique of all the books. Yes. Have you ever considered publishing that? It must be very interesting to people who had some interest in all of the books that you've read and what you had to say about them. I, I haven't thought of that, actually. Um, but but I, I, as I say, I'm, I'm giving the lectures. Uh, the lectures are on YouTube. So, I mean, they're out there, uh, if, if not in written form, at least uh, in spoken form. You've but, almost uh, got a book. Yeah. yeah. I, I will consider that. That's I want an autographed copy. <laughs> the first one I'll hot off the presses. The next one. Uh, there are no uh, movies that I know of that I can critique and criticize and hate uh, for John Winthrop. Um, but there is, a, uh, there is a, a book that came out 1958. How many of you are, are at all familiar with Anya Seton? Anybody? What have you read? Do you remember? Green something, I can't remember. Yeah. She was, uh, I read it she, as a teenager. Okay, did you like it? I did. She was a wonderful writer. Um, she does a lot, or she did, uh, a lot of uh, biographical fiction um, back in the 40s and 50s, I believe. And uh, I think there's actually movies made of some of her, her novels. Um, uh, 586 pages, so it's not a short read but uh, well worth your time. If you come across, really, I, I think anything from Anya Seaton is, uh, uh, she's very intelligent, uh, very uh, thorough in her, uh, her examination of these uh, historical characters. Um, so the, the Winthrop woman is, uh, she's talking about John Winthrop's uh, daughter-in-law a woman who married one of John Winthrop's sons, um, who, sub well, I won't get into it too much, but uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of a coming of age. Uh, the woman goes through many, many experiences in her life, uh, and with the background of being in uh, Massachusetts, uh, traveling from one place to another, and her uh, austere, uh, Im imposing, uh, God-like father-in-law, uh, John Winthrop. 
Okay. The early years. Born January 12, 1588, to Adam and Anne Brown Winthrop. Uh, they were well-to-do family. Uh, his grandfather had bought from King Henry VIII uh, a, uh, uh, a, a, not a church, but a, uh, uh, now I'm, I'm losing, I hate when I do this. Um, the, the monastery, that's what I was thinking of. A monastery, many of which uh, Henry VIII had closed down because of uh, his hatred of the Catholic Church because they wouldn't give him a divorce. So uh, he, he got rid of the monasteries and sold them off to uh, well-to-do people as favors. So uh, he, uh, that was his grandfather and so Ultimately, John Winthrop inherited this Groton Manor. Um, he received a good education uh, from a local tutor, uh, attended Trinity College, uh, Cambridge, and studied law. That was what you needed to study uh, if you were going to be, uh, if you're running a manor. Because when you own a manor and the, uh, the properties that surround it, you are also the judge, you are the magistrate. And so that's what John Winthrop became. Uh, he studied law, he didn't exactly graduate, which re wasn't really even expected of him, but he became a magistrate there at Groton Manor. He married Mary Fourth at the age of 17. This was an arranged marriage. His father uh, had friends in the neighborhood who were also well-to-do, and they arranged this, um, which was fairly common uh, in the day. You wanted your son or your daughter to marry well and to have uh, increase uh, their property, the family property, in, uh, in the marriage, and he did well for himself. Um, they had six children together. They were married for 10 years, and she uh, sadly passed away, I believe in childbirth, but I, I forget about that one. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, he married Thomasine Clompton. She died in childbirth a year later. And then he married the true love of his life. At the age of 30, he married uh, Margaret Tyndall. And this is a true love story a meeting of minds uh, like few, I think, uh, are fortunate enough to have in life. Uh, she was very intelligent, just like him. Uh, she was very religious, just like him. Um, Hardworking, and they were truly soulmates. Uh, there is a number of very touching love letters that we have. Uh, we lost quite a few of them over the time, but uh, a few that have been left, uh, as I say, are very touching. Uh, they were separated uh, a number of times when he came to uh, the New World. Uh, he came first, and there was a separation of about a year before she arrived. And so they said that uh, they would think of each other uh, like lovers do uh, between 5 and 6 o'clock every Friday, every Monday. Uh, I will spend time thinking of you. And... Uh, that daylight <laughs> Of course, they probably never thought of, you know, five, my five o'clock here is not her five o'clock there. But, but lovers don't think in those terms. It's just, I'm thinking of you, my dear. Uh, and they would sign their letters, things like, my, mine own, mine only, my best beloved, my love, my joy, my faithful one. Uh, that's the kind of uh, syrupy stuff that you'll see in their letters. And I, I've read a couple of them, and I think, wow. Um, they, I mean, he goes on and on. It's not just, you know, a short sentence, how much I love you, and uh, I went to the store and bought some groceries. Uh, it's just on and on about uh, various aspects of how much I love you. It's kind of like, uh, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Um, so, yeah, really something for a Puritan. Uh, you don't think in those terms very often, but yes, 
They were very much in love. They were impure in them. <laughs> <laughs> but they were married, so that's, they made it pure. Uh, they had eight children in the years that they were married, uh, four of whom uh, reached adulthood. So the Puritan movement. Um, John Winthrop became a Puritan, got involved in that movement in, in his late teens. Um, but what was going on in England at the time? Uh, Charles I uh, became king after James I passed, uh, 1625. Um, James I uh, was not too keen on the Puritans. Uh, as we know from last week, uh, he didn't like the pilgrims, and they were being persecuted. But the, uh, the Puritans were an irritant too. The Puritans were not separatists. They wanted to purify the Church of England from within. And so in that sense, they could be even more annoying to the king who wanted to control what the church was teaching. So um, he appointed, uh, Charles I appointed uh, Bishop Laud, uh, who was very much in tune with the king in uh, cracking down on the Puritans. This went very badly for everyone concerned. Uh, and so the Puritans decided, well, maybe we need to set up our own colony just like uh, the pilgrims did. And so they formed together the Massachusetts Bay Company and officially it's a trading company. Jamestown was set up by the Virginia Company, and they sent the, the uh, colonists out, and uh, they were gonna find gold and make lots of money. Uh, the uh, merchant and venturers uh, financed the pilgrims and sent them out, and they were going to make money. Of course, neither one of these operations did make money, but the idea was, this is a, uh, a merchant Adventure. This is going to make money for us. We're doing this uh, as a business venture. Um, and so the Massachusetts Bay Company, formed by Puritans, were going to do the same thing. Only making money was a side note. They were going to do this as a, as a missionary outreach uh, to set up their own colony so that they could be in a place where they're not going to be persecuted. And there was one significant difference about this group, and that is uh, the charter that they got from the king, uh, they were taking with them. The company was not going to be in England trying to direct the colonists in America. The company itself was going to the New World. That way they were in charge and uh, nobody was the, their overseer from England. And even before they left, they recognized John Winthrop as the natural leader of this group and they elected him as governor. So Winthrop sailed to the New World in the flagship Arbella with 10 other ships, 1,000 colonists altogether were arriving. This was going to be a significant difference uh, from Jamestown and Plymouth. They were, this was going to be a well-financed operation. Uh, they were not going to be suffering. Uh, they were going to learn the lessons of the other two colonies. Uh, of course, they still uh, suffered, not as much as the others, but they still suffered. Uh, many of the people who came across were uh, middle to mid, upper middle class uh, people from England. Uh, the Puritans were well known to be uh, wealthy, uh, if not royalty, in England. And so uh, their ships, their 10 ships, uh, were uh, much better stocked, much better supplied than the previous voyages. Uh, however, there were a number of poor people who came as well, uh, who barely had enough just for their passage. 
And so uh, when they arrived in the new world, uh, these poorer sorts uh, suffered terribly and, and spread that to the others as well. Uh, Winthrop, <coughs> Uh, he preached a sermon. Even though he was not a uh, pastor, uh, he did not have a divinity degree, he preached many sermons throughout his life and was often asked to preach sermons in church. This is the most famous of them, a model of Christian charity. We're not sure where he preached this, whether it was before they left or whether it was on the ship, on the trip over, or maybe he preached it when they arrived. <coughs> Uh, but uh, this became uh, one of the most famous sermons uh, in our in colonial history. And if you look this up, uh, you'll and, and just a cursory reading of this, um, it has been uh, quoted more times than just about any other sermon uh, in our history. Uh, Ronald Reagan in his inaugural address talked about John Winthrop and how John Winthrop in this sermon uh, talked about the city on the hill. Now, of course, that's a quote from uh, the book of Matthew where uh, we shall be as a city on the hill. In, the, in that sense, everybody's going to see us. We will be a model for the world and we will have our uh, city uh, as a beacon of light for everyone else to follow. We will be uh, a Christian colony, and um, we will, uh, he actually mentions either we will be uh, a light to the rest of the world and an example for everybody to follow, or we will be a byword to the rest of the world and a complete failure that everybody will look to and mock. And that is our choice as we go, as we start this colony. So here is the Arbella. And when they came to uh, Massachusetts, or what became Massachusetts, uh, they weren't sure at first where they were going to settle. Uh, they already had a small settlement in Salem with uh, I, I, I'm not sure how many people, but it was a very small village, and they thought they were going to settle there at first, and then they realized that it was just not suitable, so they settled in Cambridge, and for a while they thought that that might be the right place, but very soon they realized uh, the peninsula, Boston Peninsula, would be the place that uh, they would finally settle. And there we have Boston, Salem's up there, Massachusetts Bay Colony. <clears throat> so I said that uh, they were much better financed, much better supplied than the previous uh, expeditions, uh, colonists that came out, but they still had their starving time. <clears throat> Winthrop, as governor, uh, and, and as any leader should be, he, uh, he set the example. He was not going to stand back and watch everybody work and order everybody else around. He was going to get in there and he was going to work himself. And he shared, being a wealthy man, he put in an awful lot of money for this expedition and he shared what he had with others who did not have. Uh, he worked, uh, he suffered, uh, he ate what everybody else ate and he shared what he had. He sent uh, trading missions to the local tribes of Indians to trade for corn. And uh, he personally met with and entertained in his own home uh, the natives who would come to trade with them. And so because they were so much better prepared than the other colonies, instead of a 50% death rate, which the others suffered, uh, they suffered a 20% death rate, which was still incredibly high for our standards, um, with 200 people dying uh, the first year. Uh, but uh, that was significantly better than uh, the other colonies. Did they all die of um, starvation? 
starvation or disease? Uh, well, the starvation led to disease often. So once they make this trip across, uh, several people will have scurvy. Uh, you know, I've mentioned before how miserable the trip is from England to America in these uh, small ships, uh, crowded. The food is horrendous and becomes rancid within a few weeks. Uh, it took two months for this trip to come, uh, for this uh, voyage. Um, and uh, really, after the first month, you're going to be suffering terribly with what is left of the food. And so, when by the time people reach the New World, um, they're already uh, practically starving. They're they're sick. Uh, many have scurvy. Um, so, and once and if you reach alive the New World. Uh, you're still going to be suffering because the foodstuffs are, are running low. Uh, and for the next several months, really for the next year, uh, you're going to be low on food. So the weakness that uh, the body has endured uh, at, from the trip over uh, led to the many diseases that killed so many people. So I, I think probably not many actually die of starvation but they die of, of complications uh, with regard to the uh, nutritional uh, uh, def, uh, deficiencies. Benson. Yes. How do the resupply ships find where they find the flight to the right place? How do they navigate or, or to land in the same place? Well, they don't. Okay. Um, what happens is back in those days, they knew where they were going. This wasn't like Plymouth, where we just show up someplace and, well, I guess we'll just stay here. Did uh, they have sent letters back saying, you know, turn left at, you know, right, right. So, many, so many days, or was there longitude and latitude technology at that time? So once, once they come across and they hit land, then they start, and there are maps. Uh, as we know, John Smith explored and made some very extensive maps of that area and so people would hopefully have those maps uh, the, the captains who would uh, sail out and so uh, once they reached land then they would take their bearings because they wouldn't know north or south where they were uh, they would know this is America and so we take a look at our maps look at the coastline okay this matches up with this area, so we need to go north and we need to go south and to find where uh, the, the colony is. But like, as I say, there's, Salem was already settled by a, a couple of years before by the uh, uh, Puritans who had sent uh, some early uh, uh, colonists out. So, uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, but it just seems like one peninsula looks like any other peninsula from you're not a sailor, are you? <laughs> no. So, so the, the, captain is, the captain of these ships are uh, hopefully have been experienced sailors who recognize the coastline pretty well. Uh, and I, I think I mentioned before that uh, uh, fishing vessels have been coming out for a hundred years. I mean, it's named Cape Cod for a reason. They, these uh, fishing vessels have been coming out from the early uh, 1500s to catch cod. And so there's many uh, captains who would be familiar with the coastline. So if, if they were out of food when they landed, essentially, right? What did they, they, they wouldn't be out of food, but the food that they had would be pretty rancid. And so they would still have supplies of food that would last them some time but they really want to get something fresh um, to supplement that with. And so like uh, the uh, Jamestown colonists or the Plymouth colonists, you, you can fish, you go for oysters, clams. Uh, hopefully you have some hunters who can shoot some, uh, some fowl or some deer, and then they would have something in the way of fresh food to supplement what they have. So Puritan government, this is, this is uh, the really interesting part of the development of our nation. 
because this, as I said, this was not initially uh, or officially uh, going to be uh, a, a colony in a municipal uh, government. This was a, uh, a company uh, that's supposed to make money. The people who go with you are essentially uh, your employees or people who are going to support the company. But you have to have some <clears throat> laws, rules, and regulations. And so this was set up, uh, and this was how the government was supposed to work. There were the freemen, and that's basically the, uh, the Puritans who were financing this operation were essentially the freemen. Uh, they were to meet four times a year at a general court to make laws. Uh, once a year, they would elect uh, the governor, deputy governor, and 18 assistants. Uh, and they, those were to manage the affairs of the colony. Um, and the assistants would uh, meet once a month in an executive council. Now, there are not a thousand, but uh, very close to a thousand, several hundred people, and they were all supposed to be ruled by this small group of Puritans. Um, when we say uh, 18 assistants would be elected, um, that was, in, at the time, that's about how many freemen there were also. So the freemen uh, would essentially elect themselves, and then they would elect the governor, deputy governor, um, and they would be uh, the government and everybody else would just do what they're told. But it, it didn't work out that way. Because at the first general court that was met, that they met, um, there were 116 adult men who were free, not uh, indentured servants. Uh, and the company, the Puritan leadership, opened up the uh, the designation freeman to all of them. They didn't have to do that. The charter did not designate them as freemen. It was the investors, the 20 or so people, men, uh, who had invested and put this whole operation together who could have been the sole leaders uh, and lawmakers of this colony. But they opened it up to all men uh, who were not indentured servants. And so the colony, the company, becomes a commonwealth. Pardon me. Yes? What, just what does commonwealth mean? Um, it's a good question. It, it's it essentially <clears throat> a, a civic body, you know, a, a group that, uh, that bands together as a town, a country, uh, a political body, basically, is the way I see it. So as, de as, as opposed to a, uh, a company that's just uh, a business, which is really what it was set up to be. So instead of just a company, uh, we are now a municipality. We are a government of the people. And so the general court, how, what did it operate and what did it do? Well, it did a lot of things that uh, we wouldn't consider as uh, something that a general court or a government would do, uh, but back in those days uh, was common. They set prices for corn and other goods. They set wages for laborers. Uh, they would settle land disputes. <coughs> and they did things like, uh, here's a, uh, Mr. Clark, someone that you'll never hear of again, uh, but he was living in the home of a family. And um, because there's such a shortage of houses, this is what both Plymouth Colony and Massachusetts would do for all the single men. The single men uh, did not have to live by themselves because there wouldn't be enough houses. 
they would be given to uh, a family. You're going to live with such and such a family if you were a single man. Well, this one didn't work out too good because he was making eyes at the wife. <laughs> and uh, she got very uncomfortable and so complained to her husband. And the husband brought this to the general court and said, this man is uh, making eyes at my wife and making all of us very uncomfortable, so you need to do something about this. And so the general court says, okay, we'll move him to another house. And that was something that uh, the general court could do. Um, uh, Nicholas Knopp was fined five pounds for making fake cures for scurvy. He would basically uh, get a bottle of water and put something in it and say, this will cure your scurvy. Uh, long tradition in the United States, I think, of uh, quack cures. <clears throat> still going on. Yes, yeah, still going on today. Uh, so that's another issue that the general court uh, came, uh, dealt with. He was fined. Uh, five pounds for his uh, fake cures. Uh, John Stone uh, was suspected of adultery. John Stone was not a resident. Uh, he was a trader that would sail from one place to another. Uh, he was cleared of the charge uh, because there was not enough evidence, uh, but he was given a suspended fine of 100 pounds because he called one of the justices a just ass. <laughs> which is terribly insulting to the, the, the dignity of the justices. Um, and so he was ordered to leave and not come back. Uh, and not, and when, when the Puritans tell you, you are banished and you are to leave, um, they are serious about that. Uh, it is, you are banished on pain of death. If you come back, you will be executed. So he left. So John Winthrop as governor. Um, in reading about John Winthrop, uh, I have such a great ad admiration for him. I see him as something of a George Washington figure because he was the type of guy who could walk into a room and everybody look at, he is the leader. He's, he carries this uh, aura with him. He's the type of man that you want as your leader he carries the authority with him uh, in, a, in an easy manner. Uh, he doesn't come in and he's not, he doesn't lose his temper. Uh, he does, he's not overbearing in an angry way, uh, but he is, he's wise, uh, very intelligent, and, um, and the type of man you just admire because of his character qualities. And he, uh, was the one that everybody wanted, just about, uh, as their governor. Um, and he would travel. He's very caring of the populace, and he would travel from town to town to help settle disputes, help inspire the, uh, the, the uh, colonists, and give sermons on Sundays and throughout the week uh, also. Um, so there's this one dispute in Watertown. Uh, their pastor, uh, it, with some others, had this terrible idea that the Catholic Church uh, was a true church. And this is something that was anathema to the Puritans. Uh, we uh, know that the Catholic Church is a satanic church, that God has rejected it. And uh, it's just common knowledge amongst us that uh, the Catholics... Um, are on the road to hell. So when the pastor in the Massachusetts colony started telling his parishioners that, well, you know, the Catholic Church really can be considered a true church of God. Um, they may have some errors, but we shouldn't reject them out of hand. And that, that was a big uh, problem. So John Winthrop travels there and has debates. He discusses with them about this issue. Certainly you know that the Catholics can't be considered a true church of God. And uh, as time went on, uh, he corrected their errors. But um, for those who 
uh, whose minds would not be changed, and, and he ultimately could not convince the pastor, although he convinced the rest of the congregation of the error. So the pastor would not change his mind. But the, uh, the congregation accepted him anyway, except for one or two people. And that became a problem because uh, how are you going to take communion in a church when you turn your back on your pastor? That was too much for this, for a, did I name it? Uh, I guess I didn't. Um, the man who could not tolerate having a pastor who accepted uh, the church, uh, the Catholic Church, as a true church, and so what do you do about that? Well, uh, John Winthrop again comes and talks with this guy, and says, "Look, he may be in error about this, but you still need to accept him as your pastor," and the man would not. So the church excommunicated the man who would not accept the pastor. So that's kind of an interesting thing. They did not excommunicate the pastor for believing that the Catholic Church is a true church, but they excommunicated the man who refused to accept the pastor who believed that the Catholic Church was a true church. Yes? Where did the Catholics come from at this point? I mean, there were no Catholics in, okay. in America. They're just debating. They're just debating it oh. back in Europe. Yes. Because that's... Uh, that was still a big issue. What do you do about the, the terrible heresies of the Catholic Church? So there they are in church. So uh, John Winthrop's deputy governor was uh, Thomas Dudley. And this is the type of man uh, that you think of when you think of the dour, arrogant, narrow-minded Puritan, that's Thomas Dudley. Uh, he did not get along with a lot of people, but he was very pious, he was very Puritan, and so he had a following because of that. And um, uh, John Winthrop had a, somewhat of a difficult time with him because uh, <coughs> Thomas Dudley wanted to be very strict in uh, punishing those who would break the law. John Winthrop, uh, his thought was, look, this is a new colony. This is a new government. We need to be more lenient towards those uh, who would break the law uh, because uh, we are a new government. And um, we need to inspire by love and not by harsh treatment. And Thomas Dudley was just the opposite. Because we are a new colony, we need to be more harsh towards people who break the law. And John Winthrop would do things like uh, he might lessen the, uh, the penalty or the, the fine that was imposed on someone if he banished someone from the colony. He would give them much more time uh, to settle their things. If it's winter time, we're not going to banish somebody in the midst of winter. We'll wait till springtime. We'll give them time. Uh, Thomas Dudley was just the opposite. Uh, the fines should be imposed, and they should be harsh. The, uh, when we banish someone, they need to go right away because they shouldn't be here. And so there's uh, that, that tension between the two uh, lasted throughout uh, the rest of uh, John Winthrop's life. Um, Dudley became governor in 1634 after the first four years of uh, uh, John Winthrop being governor. And by the way, uh, they're elected every year. I think I mentioned that earlier. And so every year they have uh, the elections for all of the different positions. On this fourth year, uh, they decided, and they let him know, uh, we are thinking that we should not have you as governor <laughs> perpetually. Not because we don't love you, not because we don't respect you and the job that you've done, but we don't want to make this into a hereditary monarchy. That's what we're afraid of. 
we do not want someone uh, in perpetuity as our leader. And they let him know that. And he wrote that in his journal, that uh, even though uh, he's, he's not going to be governor, he's not going to be elected this time, we still love you. We're not rejecting you. We're just saying we don't want this, uh, any one person as our leader uh, and just assume that he's going to be. However, uh, there were some bad feelings uh, between, as I said, Dudley and a few others who uh, didn't like the idea of him being so lenient towards the colonies, the colonists. And so uh, once he was uh, out of the office, they said they wanted to do an audit and came to him and, and asked him to account for the expenditures that were made. And he said, sure thing. I will let you know that I actually paid the bills on a number of occasions for the colony out of my own funds. And so uh, they got a good lesson in uh, the generosity of, of John Winthrop and to be very careful about how they're going to accuse him of anything. Roger Williams, next week, we're going to be talking about Roger Williams. Roger Williams first came to America, uh, to Boston, uh, as a, uh, an up-and-coming, young, charming, uh, very intelligent uh, pastor. And when he arrived, uh, he, was given a, he was offered a position in the church as a teacher. He rejected it. Roger Williams was going to be more pure than the Puritans. As I say, very charming, very likable young man, and very intelligent. But uh, he was going to be very exacting in his beliefs uh, about uh, their Christian faith. And he became, immediately on leaving England, he became a separatist. You here in Boston, the churches in Massachusetts, have not repented of the evil of associating yourselves with the Church of England. The Church of England is no true church. You should repent of that and become a separate church. And of course, they hadn't. They're not going to separate themselves from the church. But that wasn't all. Also, um, when you came to America, you got a patent from the king, the charter that gives you these lands. Uh, you need to repent of that too, because uh, the king had no right to give you lands that belonged to the Indians. And this was the first notion of that in the New World. Roger Williams was going to treat them well. They are God's uh, creatures as well as we, and we cannot just come here and take their lands without uh, their permission. And the king, who never even spoke to uh, a Native American, uh, cannot give you these lands. And finally, to top it off, here's Roger Williams who believes in the separation of church and state completely. So we cannot, <clears throat> we cannot punish people for breaking the Sabbath. That is a church religious issue. Uh, we cannot uh, punish people for uh, things like uh, saying God's name in vain and other religious, purely religious uh, laws that we have. And so that's where Roger Williams was coming from. He did not accept the position uh, in Boston. He went up to Salem where they kind of accepted his views at first until uh, John Winthrop came up there and argued with them and said, no, uh, this guy is not right. Uh, so they rejected him and he went to Plymouth. Well, the Plymouth people are separatists, so that should be okay. He stayed with them for a year or so until he got too much for them. He was more pure than the uh, pilgrims. Came back and uh, started to get settled in Salem once again until, uh, again, John Winthrop uh, exposed his errors to them. 
And finally, uh, he was banished because uh, he was stirring up too much trouble in uh, Massachusetts. They needed to get rid of him. Who actually banished him? The court. He was taken yes. to... Uh, the, it, the Massachusetts yeah. State Court, okay. Yeah. Uh, he, was, he was saying things uh, that were, you know, his positions on a lot of things were not illegal. But when he started saying things about the king, how the king uh, could not uh, give land, uh, how the king um, was wrong in what he did, and the church itself saying too many things about uh, the, the laws and how the church should not be uh, influencing, or religious uh, laws should not be influencing uh, the civic laws. Mm -hmm. Things so, like that. That's when it started becoming illegal. And when he started stirring up a lot of people who wanted to follow him, they realized they needed to get rid of him. Now, uh, he was banished. He was supposed to be sent back to England. But of all people, uh, John Winthrop sent him a letter and said, um, we are, we're sending someone to come and get you to ship you off. I know you don't want to go back to England. I'm just giving you this warning. And so he took it and escaped out to Rhode Island and started his own colony, which we'll talk about next week. But uh, John Winthrop, to his credit, was a type of man who did not hold grudges. Uh, he did not think bitterly of people who disagreed with him. And he had a lifelong friendship with Roger Williams, with whom he had some very deep disagreements. So um, I assume then that everybody who lived in these colonies had to go to church. So. Or else. Um, they assumed that everybody would. Mm -hmm. There was no law at first saying you had to go to church because everybody did. Yeah. It wasn't until uh, 1635 when uh, more and more people were coming. And this is something I, I'm not really talking much about, but uh, uh, Massachusetts grew uh, tremendously through the uh, 1630s. Thousands and thousands of people were coming over uh, largely because of the turmoil that was going on in England. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of people were coming over and uh, a lot of them were Puritans, some of them were not. And so by 1635, they realized there was an awful lot of people uh, who were not going to church uh, who were coming. And so then they, they made the law that yes, you must go to church each Sunday. And then we have the infamous Ann Hutchinson and I, I mentioned uh, before the lecture that uh, one of these days I really want to do a full lecture just on Anne Hutchinson because she's a fascinating person. Um, I already have like three or four books on her uh, that I have yet to read. Um, so she was a midwife, a mother of 12, uh, very intelligent, quite possibly the smartest person in the colony. And, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, there's an awful lot of very intelligent people uh, in the colony, men, very well-educated men. Uh, she might just have been the smartest of them. Um, more pure than the Puritans. Uh, one of the issues that you have when you become a, a, a Puritan of any sort, whatever belief you have, and you are fervently uh, and openly uh, promoting this idea, whether it's a religious or political or whatever, you get a whole bunch of people like that together and they try to outdo each other in their purity. And that's what is happening here. So um, she was a follower of John Cotton, who is one of the leading pastors in Boston, uh, absolutely loved his sermons and thought of him as uh, the great leader of the colony. But uh, she started having ideas of her own, uh, becoming more pure than the rest of them. She held meetings in her home, which was not illegal for a woman to do. Uh, it was not unusual for uh, 
the uh, okay, leader of women to have meetings after church or through the week discussing the pastor's sermons and issues of the day uh, regarding religious uh, subjects. Uh, the problem that she had, or the problem that the Puritans had with her, was that a lot of men would show up to these meetings. And so she could have 60 or 80 people showing up uh, to listen to her and her home, and many of them men. Um, and when she got going, she got going. She could tell them uh, how wonderful it is that, how, that her deep faith in God has, has given her uh, the ability to tell the difference between someone who's truly saved and those who are faking it. And she could designate this person, that person is truly saved, and this other, sometimes pastors, uh, who are uh, not really uh, of the chosen. Uh, they are faking it. They are deceiving you. Uh, they preach a, 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 a salvation of works, of uh, their own sanctity. And I can tell the difference. And I will show you how to tell the difference. So that became very ugly because now you have a group of people uh, going around uh, pointing out who is truly saved and who is a reprobate, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And uh, so she had a very uh, significant following in Massachusetts, and, um, and it became too much. Uh, she was taken to court, uh, and she was banished. In the trial, it was a two-day trial that she had. She stood before the magistrates and she outdid all of them. The, the transcripts that we have show her to be uh, extremely sharp uh, and ma actually made fools of the magistrates, uh, John Winthrop included, because they were so set on getting rid of her. Uh, they were coming up with any excuse for it. Uh, when they said, you are teaching men in your home, you know that's not allowed. The Bible itself says that women are not to teach men. And she said, I'm not teaching men. I'm teaching women. The men just show up. <laughs> what am I supposed to do about that? <laughs> and there's a number of points uh, that she would outwit them at every turn until the end. When they finally were asking her, so how is it that you know the difference between someone who's truly saved and not? And she would, ultimately, she came down to, uh, God is speaking to me personally. And that was too much. Uh, to, for someone to say that I have a direct line to God and he is telling me things, uh, that's basically, you don't even need the Bible anymore. You just have God talking to you. And that could not be tolerated. So she was banished along with her family and a few followers. By this time, um, they had embarrassed so many of the followers that um, uh, she did not have very many following her when she was banished. Uh, she was killed uh, five years later in an Indian raid uh, in the, the Dutch colony at the time. Mr. Hutchinson, he's, he's a non-entity. He's a non-entity. Non you can read all about Anne Hutchinson and know almost nothing about her husband because he's just kind of there for the ride. It was just, uh, it's kind of like uh, a lot of the men. If you study a man, just about any man back in those days, uh, well, who's his wife? Uh, I don't know, so-and-so, you don't even remember her. Uh, and this is just the opposite. She's a big personality. Uh, with a husband that you know almost nothing about because he never accomplished anything. So, Anne Hutchinson. So this first picture um, is a painting of her teaching in her home. And I thought, what in the world is she doing? You look at this guy, it's like, what is she teaching, sign language or something? Um, and then here she is being marched to court and standing before 
the uh, justices very proudly, uh, very uh, intelligently uh, fending off all of their accusations. So one does not generally think of separation of church and state when you're thinking of the Puritans. And yet, the Puritans themselves wanted a certain separation. They did not like how intertwined the Church of England was with the government of England. And there were certain things they wanted separated. Um, so the, the followers of Anne Hutchinson, the people who sympathized with her, were very <laughs> angry at John Winthrop uh, because of this. And so once it was done and she was banished, uh, the church, the, the people in the church, wanted to call uh, John Winthrop uh, to account, not in a civic sense, but in the church. Maybe, they, maybe we could uh, excommunicate him for the evils that he has committed against Anne Hutchinson. John Winthrop um, argued back and said, a church hath not power to call any civil magistrate to give account of his judicial proceedings in any court of civil justice, which in, in our day, of course, it makes perfect sense. You can't uh, accuse someone of doing something wrong in church when they are a government official performing their official duties. Uh, but back in those days, that was uh, fairly novel. Uh, a church could uh, accuse a, a, a government official of wrongdoing or blasphemy or whatever uh, in their official duties, but not in America. Because, as he said, uh, then the church and not the civil magistrates uh, would be the supreme court of the, law, of the land. The church should become the supreme court in the jurisdiction and not uh, the real courts. Now we come to uh, a very unpleasant uh, moment in our history uh, that uh, was repeated far too often, and that's their dealings with the Native Americans. Uh, like the other colonies, uh, they had to deal with the local tribes, some of them friendly, some of them not so much. Uh, the uh, Massachusetts government had uh, far fewer problems with the Native Americans, uh, probably mostly because there were so many uh, colonists that they didn't have to worry about being attacked and wiped out, like uh, Jamestown or Plymouth. But they did have the Pequots to deal with. The Pequots were a tribe along the Connecticut River. Uh, and this is not anywhere near Massachusetts, uh, Boston area, but uh, they were setting up trading posts. The uh, Massachusetts and Plymouth were setting up trading posts along the Connecticut River, and they were having problems with the Pequots. Pequots were also uh, troublesome to other Native American tribes like the Narragansetts uh, and the Mohegans, <coughs> not to be confused with the Mohicans. Um, and so basically they all got together and they said, we need to deal with these Pequots. And they did, uh, not in the way that Native Americans generally deal with enemy tribes. They dealt with them the way uh, Americans, American Puritans would deal with them. You wipe them out. And so they sent, uh, th the initial uh, uh, troops went out and they burned a few villages, didn't kill anybody, but they burned a few villages to send a message. And that didn't seem to be enough, so they sent out another uh, expedition. Uh, they wiped out a couple of villages. Several hundred uh, men, women, and children were murdered in these expeditions. Um, the Native Americans who were along with uh, the expedition, who joined, uh, were appalled. When we attack, Native Americans attack a village and plunder it, you don't kill everybody. You take the women and children for yourselves and you add them into your tribe. 
That's what they did. And they were appalled <coughs> that uh, the Puritans would go in and just massacre everybody, men, women, and children. Now, some uh, who were captured uh, were sold off as slaves or presented as slaves to various households in the Massachusetts community. But um, the, the massacre uh, was truly appalling by our standards and even the standards of the Native Americans at the, at the time. So there's the Pequot Massacre. Again, the Body of Liberties. This is a very important document, 1641. Uh, it's not so much about democracy as it is limiting government. The people of Massachusetts, and yet this was not from the top down, this is the people coming to the magistrates saying, we want more guarantees of our civil liberties. And we want them written down. We do not want, as in England, uh, with the common law, uh, the unwritten constitution. We want it written. Uh, John Winthrop uh, was in, more in favor of the common law method where when a new uh, problem arises, you deal with it as, as it arises. Uh, and we, will, we promise to do fairly for all of the new things that may arise. And uh, the people said, no, we want it written out. So, 100 provisions to limit the power of government. So it deals with property rights, trial by jury, rights of the accused, church and state issues, capital offenses, the rights of individual towns, uh, creating monopolies, things like that. And um, I really wanted to uh, get into some of the details of this, but once again, I'm going over a lot more than I realized. So I gotta keep going. Um, in uh, the, seven, uh, the 1640s, uh, John Winthrop realized that he was bankrupt. It was because of the, uh, the manager of his estates, his farms and properties, uh, was a fool. Someone who was very poor at what he did, um, almost criminal. Uh, he would sell things. So he was grossly incompetent, buying high and selling low, essentially. I, uh, uh, so John Winthrop was uh, 2,500 pounds in debt um, and very upset that some of his friends who were buying and selling to him through his manager uh, were basically cheating him. But the manager allowed it um, because he was incompetent. But uh, some of his friends uh, raised some money to help him out of his debts. <clears throat> and, um, but it took him years to dig himself out of the hole that this uh, manager had dug for him. The English Civil War, beginning in 1642. What happened to the manager? Um, he was just fired. Uh, he was, <clears throat> it was not criminal. Uh, John Winthrop looked at what he did and basically, it's like you're a, you're a, you're a damn fool. Uh, you have no sense of how to manage money or property, uh, but you couldn't really consider it criminal because he wasn't enriching himself so much. So anyway, um, the English Civil War, the Puritans in England were fighting against the king to overthrow the... Uh, the church hierarchy, basically. And so many in Massachusetts were saying, hey, look, uh, this is what we've wanted all the, the whole time. Maybe we should go back. Massachusetts is no longer necessary because uh, we can go back to England, fight against the king, and have our church there. And the people in England who were coming to America because of the persecutions uh, stopped coming. So uh, Massachusetts suffered somewhat, uh, something of a depression in the 1640s because they were losing people instead of gaining them. So 
the last years for John Winthrop. He was elected a total of 12 times to the governorship um, for uh, the rest of the years. Uh, he was either an assistant or deputy governor. Uh, his beloved wife, Margaret, died in 1647, and, and his eulogy was that she was a woman of singular virtue, modesty, and piety, and specifically, and specially beloved and honored of all the country, as she was. Um, uh, and there's another woman, by the way, who I could have a whole uh, lecture on because she was an, a, very, a very impressive uh, person in her own right. But uh, John Winthrop quickly recovered and married again within a few months, um, the spring of 1648, and had his final child from this woman. Then he died on March 26, 1649. And these two statues, these are actually the same casting, same uh, statue, just one in bronze and one in marble. Um, so this one is in Boston, and this one is in Washington, D.C. Any questions? Yes? How old was he? I think he was 61. Yeah. He was having trouble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very, uh, you didn't have to have them. Well, <laughs> how are you going to stop? No, he, he, he didn't bear the children. Oh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't bear the children. The, the wife did, yeah. Uh, anything else? Okay, so next week, Roger Williams, Rhode Island.